to share this on behalf of our team. So um, essentially, in the uh, notes that they gave you on the back of uh, page one of six and page two right there, you'll find the uh, report that KHAL produced for us. So we have, a, we have a group of block captains that have agreed to meet weekly so that we can continue to try to do some things here. Another person, uh, Colin Kumabe, he joined from a Touch of Heart organization. We're actually sitting around having our meeting. He walked up and joined in on something. And he beats about uh, 40 homeless people in Blaisdell Park on Sunday morning. So we want to we want to win. That's what we want to do. We want to be successful in our efforts. And so we came up with these six basic areas. Identification of a site for temporary affordable housing, uh, assessment of the specific needs of area homelessness and at-risk residents. We want to cultivate partnerships with area military leadership. We want to increase the community collaborations for greater efficiency. Create innovative wraparound services. And also we're looking at in the news, having some media support. So we have identified a site that's next to uh, one of our neighbor uh, providers, and that's in number one. For our St. Elizabeth's Church parking lot. It's a Navy site. We have set up a tentative meeting with them. They have been positive in their response to this. And so from our group, what I took away from the meeting is we want to be able to get the prototype placed in IAEA so that we can also complement. It would benefit our, our community because the church is there already serving the homeless and it would show the potential growth that we have as far as the container housing. So, so that's our strategy, is to start with the end from the beginning, to get the prototype placed so that we could look at it. There's also a, a military component because the military has the ability to go into an area and set up a city overnight. And so we're looking at, because uh, Hawaii Bet to Bet's involved with the clergy and stuff like that, we're looking at tapping into these resources as well. To try to, the VA actually has a strategic plan that's available through their website and pages 83 to 86, somewhere in there, it talks about collaborating with the community. And so that's what we really want to do is we want to uh, work with as many providers as we can because, because the VA has got money. That's an obvious, that's a give. And there's a lot of veterans and veteran family members that are affected by homelessness. I was homeless five years myself. I'm a veteran of the U.S. Army. Because of the VA services and all the recovery stuff, I'm, I'm hey, my family support. Here I am today talking about how to do something else. And so I appreciate everybody's work that they're doing. And so with that, um, we're going to keep it brief because there's a bunch of other people. And if there's any questions, we certainly would try to answer them. And if anybody else from the group wants to say anything, just sit back. Don, do you have an update maybe? On Charles has sick. Oh. So, yes, Can you Charles. share with the group what he's done in Hot <clears throat> Um I met Charles at the Next Step Shelter, where he uh, uh, basically built troughs to grow fish, uh, tilapia, and lettuce. And uh, he did like 300 head of lettuce in uh, 32 days. It was Manoa lettuce, it was $3 a pound, three pound heads, it came out to be $2,700 worth of crop. Okay. He did a very small amount of fish because he wasn't that interested. But I've since taken those numbers and extended them to say uh, the size of the container, which is a footprint of about 320 feet, and it can generate about $50,000 in vegetables and about $20,000 in fish every year sustainably. Would you, uh, uh, have you been able to identify uh, the um, ethnicity of the, of the people in how many are this group, how many are, uh, how long they've been in uh, Hawaii or on the island of Maui and so forth because of the fact that the assumption that I, you know, the big battles that I've had over the years with John Mizuno 
and Rita Cabanilla have been um, that you can't send people back <laughs> to to the continent of the United States if they don't come from there. And so, what's they the ethnicity? The country, with, right? uh, you know, what percentage of Native Hawaiian? What are the Caucasian? What are from the uh, um, from the uh, Pacific Islanders? Sure. No, I don't have those numbers off the top of my head. Um, looking into them as they're, they're important. There is, uh, I would say, at least a significant cohort of people that are, in fact, coming in there. And there was a bill that, you, that you're aware of that is, is addressing to connect those families, that people that came over from here uh, from the mainland, they do have to go back to the mainland. As far as the specific numbers as it relates to Maui County, I don't have, I don't have that breakdown in off that way. Thank you. You said there were some houses that had 10 cars at night in front of the house? Yes. So those are hidden homeless. Those people are homeless, but there's, th there's so many people. Well, do they live in the house? Right. They don't have any place else to go. They can't afford a place to live. So that's actually changes your 1,400 number. Well, and, that, and again. You need yeah, to count those people we, as well, right? Well, do they I, I guess have 100,000 <laughs> hidden homeless is the estimate. No, okay. 100,000? 100,000. Yeah, I would think hidden easily. Homeless. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they actually are living with family and right. friends. Couch. They probably whatever. would not, yeah. In yeah. the So we have, <laughs> uh, I think as we had discussed in several meetings prior, we have a 50,000 new unit shortage in Hawaii. 50, 50 one. 50, five, wow. zero. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of yeah. which, like, people that they go couch to couch. There's the ones that sleep couch to couch. That's what he's mentioning. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I, that's what I was going to point that out, that those are actually homeless people if you've got 10 cars in front of the house. Yeah. Sure, yeah. any of them without... It's very organized, actually. Yeah, They have a very good group. So um, the main thing I think they had wanted is more housing options available. There's, so we really need to look at the large lands in that area and talk with the property owners to see if there is interest. I know, uh, Colin, did you want to update us on the Kahale, that aspect of the line? Can so we had a meeting uh, about a week and a half ago. We've done some minutes. We're going to have another meeting. The idea behind the Kahale is to build a Hawaiian uh, communal uh, living situation for more Hawaiians. Um, and so this idea has been around for a number of years. Actually, it's a <laughs> traditional uh, model, but we brought it forward. And I know Steve Morse is one of the people who used to run the OHA housing office, among many other things he's done. Uh, but he was talking about this about 20 years ago. And uh, we never got it built. So uh, we're in the process of trying to see how to create a model. And uh, Bruce is working with us. A lot of the people in the room here have come to our meetings. Uh, we're going to have another meeting here uh, in a week. And uh, we hope to have a final report done. Um, and what our intention is is that we will establish sort of what the basic requirements are and some of the issues that need to be worked through if you wanted to build a Kahale, and then let each of the communities pick that up and run with it. So if we do some of the groundwork, it'll be easier for them to launch it in the future, and that's our hope. Our deadline is uh, in about a month and a half to complete all of our work. Mm -hmm. And then, is it, um, do you foresee asking for resources to actually build that prototype of Kahale We actually think there's some, there's some, there's a there's there's one group now that's actively working in YNI mm -hmm. that wants to do it. Uh, we've had some conversations with DHHL uh, about Ohana approaches to housing. In other words, not single family units, but clusters of right. families living together. Uh, that's a kind of a kawale. Uh, so there are a bunch of different ideas that people have been talking about for years. We're just trying to get them together get them organized so that when a community wants to do something, they won't have to go back to the beginning uh, to start the conversation. They can ramp off of what we've done if they have the land 
And if they have a, a group of people, um, you want the to The next report is in the 96813, 96817, and 96819 areas. That's Lilyha, um, downtown Chinatown, and Kalihi. Um, it, we had three meetings so far. Councilmember Fukunak, uh, and these three meetings were with various business, community organizations, government entities. Um, we actually went on three site visits. One was on Keabe Street, um, where it is currently, what is it, helping? Um, food distribution. What is it called? With food distribution. Yes, what is it called? It's part of the food bank. It's, oh. it's Hawaii. Anyway, it's on Ke'ame Street. Um, we're with Word of Life. Word of Life you know, partnered with this nonprofit, but the nonprofit has a lease on this um, first floor. It basically is a place where customers can get uh, food, whether it's perishable or non perishable, um, as well as furniture and clothing. Mm -hmm. And they currently serve on a daily basis about 300 people, uh, of which 40% are homeless and the others are not. They, many elders in the Kaka'ako area are on are on social security, and what was told to us is with that income they can afford only about a week's worth of food. Mm -hmm. So this really. Um, a real gem in our community, and we are very thankful for the, them coordinating this. The building, or the height at which this building can go is significant. It's 400 feet. Mm -hmm. um, so there is interest. We're trying to see if we can actually purchase that land. It's about $8 million then we can actually build very affordable housing on that. So we are trying to pursue that. Um, we'll have to see where we can get that funding, if it's a joint city-state kind of project. But there are seven and then the, complexes being built. The and then area. the next um, site is Imale Road. We went to visit. It's currently Montgomery Motors. But they are moving into Sam Choice on Nimitz, oh. and so they have a lease, and they're willing to, they'd like, um, and was interested in having the state or city, and possibly IHS um, partner, basically to take over that spot, so that we can have potentially a, a affordable housing or transitional housing, maybe even high center type facility um, in that building. So we're trying to look at what resources potentially are available for that. Let me just finish my report and then. And the third area was where, you know where the Eva Lay Senior Housing Project is that the state had, um, that we funded it, and it's in the process of being constructed. Well, on the mountain side of that, between that new building and the ORNL building is a very large state parcel as well. Mm -hmm. So that may be a long-term um, site for more affordable housing. Affordable meaning, you know, 60%, 50%, 30%, 20% the area median income. That's where the big poker is. So <coughs> there, um, that was something we did last week. The other um, person that came to see me now about three weeks ago was Art Hansen. He's an architect and helped with Habitat for Humanity for many years. But he created a nonprofit called the Mustard Seed Foundation. And his goal is to build 50 new family homes. He, along with a cadre of churches, are willing to actually finance the homes or help the families become um, secure mortgages and be able to get supported by the churches. What he was looking for was property, people that own property that were willing to lease for very minimal rent, you know, like the state if we lease for a dollar or ten dollars or whatever. So already um, I had shown him a property in the Lilyhai area. He said he could build three homes on that property. Um, when I had him meet with DLNR, the DLNR person shared six other tax map keys, all in this er area, punchable area, etc. So it's pretty exciting. At this point, 
uh, First Presbyterian Church and some of the other folks that are part of the Mustard Seed Foundation. They are open to other properties that people may be willing to provide. I did already ask, I had uh, visited the Big Island and in Waimea they wanted to actually build a home um, and they have much property. So that is, they've been in touch with Mr. Hansen already. Even for the, um, you know, the no Bruce, yeah, yeah, maybe that would be a better option. Yeah. So I think we need to put you folks in touch with Mr. Hansen as well. Yeah. We um, tried to call him, but he's not, not answering, so we have to call his son. Well, actually, he emailed his son. Oh, okay. And then um, the other thing is we have a Honolulu Community College in our neighborhood is willing to build one of the prototypes, the ship, um, ship containers. And Norman Takea and this gentleman, Mike, as well as the Chancellor, Lako, I think, um, she, they are all very supportive. So it's this semester, next semester, that they're looking at modifying a shipping container um, that hopefully will become one of the proto prototypes. Currently, me and him are uh, on the neighborhood board for Mikiki. We're trying to get the sidewalks cleared up uh, with the planters that you guys are seeing <laughs> over at the Thomas Square. Uh, we either are trying to uh, persuade the city in uh, uh, committing to what they agreed with uh, having uh, safe zones for the homeless or clear up the sidewalks so they can regain the spaces that they were at. Because currently, uh, for the past month, the city is engaged in this uh, kind of attack on the homeless where it's every 2.6 days they're raiding them and stealing all their personal possessions. Disruptive compassion. Right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, exactly. uh, it, there is no warning. There is nothing. They're doing these at like two, three, four o'clock in the morning. Is, um, as we've talked about in previous meetings, I think it would be helpful to identify and work with property owners that are willing to have these types of safe zones. So, if you look at the community and what people want to do in each of those communities, they prefer that there be permanent housing. Short of that, I think people, if there are areas within your community that the property owner is willing to have a place for people to stay, then we need to work on that. I Having people live on the sidewalks constantly is not going to be a good answer. We need to start focusing on the permanent housing and focusing on safer, to me, more respectful, more... Um, dignified areas. I fully them. agree with that, but currently right now we have approximately 75 people that live within a 3-4 block radius mm -hmm. that is mm -hmm. engaging in just violence. Mm -hmm. Okay, when, when your community is turning into a violent sector of Honolulu because they're all either beating and stealing from each other because the city wants to engage in these kind of practices, you have, you have to do something to help these people out to calm down and have some kind of safety so you can at least try to organize what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. the, it's it's so not a thing that nobody wants a, to help. As, we, do you have the ability, I've talked to you before, do you have the ability to actually pull these people together so we can actually ascertain what their needs are? Because once we understand what their needs are, then we can connect them up with resources. Right now, the only discussions that happen is how to get the city to stop so they can even try to address themselves to understand what they need and what to do. I don't, I don't believe there's, I think there's a real big misconception of what's going on with the city and how it, it's hurting our, your, our communities. I mean, we can't, to talk of sustainable housing is great. Everybody, we all need to find this. We all agree on that. But to ask individuals of what they need and what they want or how can we help them, the first thing that's coming out of their mouths is, help me get away from the city. Well, that's all they're concerned about because when their stuff is stolen, their kids are sleeping on the street or they're sleeping on the street, as you say, it's not dignified, but they're out in the open, you know, and people are walking by kicking them or doing whatever. Yeah, I'm see. close because I'm supposed to be at a function at 7. It's got some really good to share with people. It's about this kiosk idea. It has a zero footprint. It's very easy to use for the, for the homeless. 
Uh, it's just a temporary thing. It answers a temporary thing right away. This is something I saw in one key kia, where a gentleman is sleeping on the top shelf of one of those kiosks. He's got his bag underneath him, so he's worried about it. But underneath his head is a bunch of stuff that he surely doesn't want to get stolen. So I thought of this idea. They put in the magazines the very next day. So I said, well, that gave me the idea of putting two of these back-to-back, -back, mounting it on a portable cement slab. The benefit to the landowners is that you can put something on there for a month. You can do a month-to-month -month lease and move it from place to place. It makes it very portable where you can put a dozen onto it. What it does for the homeless person is it gives them immediate shelter out of the rain. It gives them a place where they can store their stuff on the bottom shelf and lock it so that they can actually go out and go get, get a job and not look homeless. Having that backpack on you is just an indicator that it really looks bad. The top shelf you can sleep on and you can actually put a lock on it so you can have that safety. The idea is to put this in a place, I was thinking about why I at first, and, uh, and putting it by a large bathroom, and putting these near an outdoor shower or porta potties. It's a place to sleep from 9 o'clock at night to 5 o'clock in the morning. What that allows a person to do is to get a good night's sleep so they can get up and go to that job. That's what the whole purpose is. This is just a temporary thing to get uh, people right off the ground immediately. And uh, then if you think that's interesting at all, mm -hmm. please talk to me afterwards or I'll give you my card. Thank you for the moment. Thank you. Thank you. Um, is there any other reports? No? Okay, I think we need to pursue this a little further. If folks actually want to gather at least a few people from the 96814 area. It's a bulletin on the foundation, stuff like that. You can change the container, change all the stuff. Uh, it's pre-publicated. You can insert, uh, uh, you know, these sleeping quarters. Uh, it's got a... So looks like this. Working with Don, because they are in the camp. That's the sleeping quarters. Pull them on beds. Bathroom. That's uh, a bathroom. And that's how it looks. So. I, I do know that the UH School of Architecture doctoral mm -hmm. students are also, that's their semester um, oh, project this statue? year. So, okay. And Don Cresimano has been working with Jim Schmidt, another architect on mm -hmm. that. So right. I, I'm glad that there are many people, you know, Eric and others that are looking at this. We do need folks that are property owners willing to help at least uh, in regards to that. Mm -hmm. so, <laughs> It includes state, state, uh, county, as well as private sector owners. But I'm so sorry. I have a funeral to go to. I'm sorry I have to um, close it on time. But I look forward to all of you continuing to work in the neighborhoods. We'll meet each other October 7th.